Well, James pointed out earlier last week that one nice thing about this is somehow the coffee seems to taste that much sweeter, uh, especially outside at these beautiful mornings. So I uh, see everyone raising their cups. Um, we got to find some small silver linings, and that's certainly one of them. Um, so today we've got a few things to go over. Um, we're going to have a little unemployment update with James. I, I know Scott and James were already talking about some of the unemployment issues, but um, I, I imagine many of you have more questions and um, uh, and maybe comments about navigating unemployment and, and, and changes there. So we're going to have some unemployment updates from James. Bethany's going to bring us some updates on the Paycheck Protection Program and the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. I'm going to walk through a comparison between the um, employee retention credit and the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, thank, uh, many of the examples came thanks to you. I've, I've made them a little bit anonymous, but I appreciate your help with that. And then we've got uh, one of our board members, uh, Corey Hall, who's an attorney on the call, and she's going to help talk a little bit about um, um, about some of the legal issues and how to prioritize some of your bills going forward and what, what some of your options may be if you've got to um, get into some workout scenarios. And we'll, as always, we'll end up with um, questions and answers. So as we go, if you just wanna pop your questions into the chat box, um, when we get to the question and answer period, we'll just start running, running down those. So anything that pops into your head while, while we're going, please just use the chat box and go ahead and ask it. So I'll turn it over to James for any updates on unemployment. Good morning, everybody. Um, I pulled some stats off the um, Department of Labor website, and, and some of this stuff is mind-boggling, but I, but I think it goes to the point of why is the Department of Labor not being responsive? Because Scott and I were, were chatting earlier. We still don't have anybody that successfully navigated the, um, the, the PUA piece for the self-employed folks. And so um, it, it's just frustrating because we don't have anybody we could call. But when I look at these stats, I'm like, oh my gosh, how are these people even being alive? Um, last week alone, they processed 400,000 claims. You have to remember, we, we were running 2.2% unemployment and we have about a $4 million, a 4 million employee workforce. So that's roughly 88,000 people on the unemployment roll at any given time, which means they're processing maybe 1,700 claims a week, maybe 2,000 on a tough week, and they processed 400,000 last week, and they processed 150,000 the week before. In the six weeks ending April 25th, they processed 1,369,000 claims. 725 were deemed to have benefits, but only 444,000 of those people actually received a benefit. So they still have a backlog of 281,000 people that they have approved for claims that they still haven't funded. So if you've got people that are still, you know, half your staff's getting a check and the other half isn't, they're still just working through it. Um, in the six weeks ending 425, they paid out $388 million in benefits, which is more than what they pay out in any year. So. I'm not saying we should give these folks a break, but it does seem like they're getting through the workload. Um, and so the, the point is, I think, unfortunately, we gotta wait for another week. Um, I know y'all are tired of hearing that, but I just, I don't, I think that's the, the prudent thing. Um, and as Scott was mentioned, he's not, we're not even sure the system is set up and working because the self-employed people are supposed to get the denial, which I think are happening. And then they're supposed to get an email where they go in and fill out what's called the PUA application, which is basically where they, they um, upload their earnings information and they also tell the, the Department of Labor what date their business closed so that they can get the first claim process. So we're not even, we're not even, it's like in the six, six step process, we're not really even in the step four yet. So um, I know that's not what y'all want to hear, but I'm but I think that's just unfortunately where we are as of this moment. So um, I don't know, Josh, I guess we just have to hang another week. Thanks, James. I wish it was better news, but I think we're just dealing with 
a system that wasn't built to move this fast with this many people. Um, Bethany, do you, do you have any updates on uh, IDLE or PPP that you want to share? I sure do. I was actually watching um, a documentary on the Roosevelt's, the Kim Burns thing, and they, of course, had some great depression footage, and, you know, you saw these long unemployment lines, and it occurred to me, it's sort of weird right now, because we don't have that visual, like those numbers that James had to understand just how profound this is. We're all just staring at our computer screen at home separate. And I think that's part of the thing that's making this process hard. The other thing um, that we've talked about with you guys at other meetings is that because the SBA is so overloaded, because the Department of Labor is so overloaded, it's really hard to get answers to our questions. So what we're trying to do at Newtown is sort of triage and take your information um, because what you learn is you find things out, A, helps people figure out how long maybe they can anticipate that they're going to wait or what have you, but maybe also to help you um, just be clear about how you're supposed to spend your PPP money or what have you. So I'm going to share my screen just to show you the few little tidbits that I um, have picked up. First of all, most importantly, um, the economic injury disaster loan is, the application is actually back online. Um, and we just really honestly did not know if that would even happen. So we were pleasantly surprised to learn. It looks like it went back online uh, yesterday. So um, I don't think anybody on this call has not applied yet, but if you know anyone who has, um, please reach out to them and let them know. As you know, we, we reviewed this application together um, a few weeks ago. It's easy. We've got a great step-by-step -step guide that folks can use and get through the system. So we encourage you to get, encourage you to encourage other folks to get in that queue. Um, advances continue to be deposited regularly. The last one that I was notified about that happened on Friday was someone who applied on Sunday, April the 5th. So that was almost exactly two weeks into the application queue because that streamlined application went live on Monday, March 30th. So they're about two weeks into their backlog on the advanced deposits. We still don't know anybody. Scott, I can see you visually. Have you heard anything? You were one of the first people that I know that got in the queue on your loan award. So I, I did get an email yesterday um, from the SBA. Um, hold on, I was trying to pull it up since you were talking about it. Um, and they said, that um, they just wanted to let me know that um, my application was with a loan officer and that it was being reviewed and that I should be getting another email soon that would let me know what my next steps were. Um, okay. They said they would send me an amount and that and I could either accept it, deny it, or send back an amount that I wanted. Okay. Okay, great. So thank you for that. So that's kind of what we've been told is likely the option. So, you know, we encourage everyone to apply because it is a cheap, cheap money as loans go, but maybe you've realized you'll be fine, especially if you've gotten a PPP. On the other hand, if you want a bigger award than what they extend to you, what they'll likely do is ask you for more financial, historical financials and come back. Um, and, and they're probably looking to see if you have any kind of real estate asset to collateralize in order to make a larger loan award. But it, since Scott's one of the first people we know that got in on that streamlined application and Newtown was in the queue early on this as well, we might be able to know a little more about that process next week. So as far as the PPP goes, I'm happy to say that it seems like a lot more middle Georgia businesses are being successful with the second round, including um, nonprofits and self-employed folks who the system was a little bit more difficult for you guys initially. The system just wasn't well designed um, as far as the application goes for folks who pay themselves in ways besides with a, a, a classic payroll system. One question that we continue to get asked and it's not clear in some of the generic responses that the lenders send back to you. Um, if you are a self proprietor and you pay yourself with owner draws. So this is not if you're because contractors, it's a little easier if you pay yourself with 1099 forms, you have that and you can submit those and they're often part of your tax return. But if you pay yourself with owner draws, what they're really going to rely on are your schedule C's from your tax returns. And I know in a couple cases of folks who have not filed their 2019 tax returns, but they the, the lenders asked for them to go ahead and submit their 2019 Schedule C, even if they haven't submitted their return to the IRS yet. So they worked with their accountants to do that. Obviously, you're going to need to be mindful 
um, that you're, that, that what you submit to the IRS corresponds with what you've given to the SBA, but just know that Schedule C is what they're really looking for on that piece. But the main thing we've been starting to get questions about is actually spending the money. And we think we'll start to get more guidance um, from the SBA, but it is also gonna vary a little um, by your lender. Some banks are having you create a separate account, others aren't, but it's clear that you will be so much better off if you document your spending. Um, even if it's just showing, it's okay if, um, you know, like your payroll account go, draws from a different uh, business account than the account you set aside with your PPP funds, but you just need to show those transfers and document that, keep some kind of spreadsheet and then just show that deposit being made into your, say it's your business banking account. Um, one, one thing that's come up, a couple of folks have told me that their PPP, even though they'd already gotten their idle advance, their PPP award amount did not deduct the advance. I still would not consider that money that they're going to forgive you on. So just because you've gotten the idle advance and your PPP lender did not subtract that from your PPP loan award total, do not assume that you're going to get both of those, uh, both the PPP loan award and your idle advance forgiven. That I think they could, when you submit your um, your eligible expenses, ask you about that again in eight weeks. So so don't count on that money. Um, until it's clear that the SBA is not gonna ask for it back. Um, some self-employed people who have gotten approved have been asking about how they pay themselves in a way that would be official. What, what I've read is that it's, it's recommended that you take that average monthly compensation that was determined, that you determined with your um, tax paperwork and maybe your income statements as your average monthly compensation and then deposit that from your PPP account into your personal account. Um, but just to stay at that pre-disaster average monthly compensation rate. Uh, I had to look around for this a lot. Somebody yesterday asked me, what are the eligible expenses? So, you know, 25% of your PPP loan can be spent on rent, utilities, or eligible interest expenses. But just to underline those eligible utilities are gas, electricity, water, phone, internet, and essentially uh, fuel costs for your business vehicles. It does not include security. Somebody asked me about security yesterday. And there was one other one that somebody asked me about that is not included here. And it's also important to know a lot, a lot of times um, if rent or mortgage have been listed, but it's actually not the, your full mortgage payment. It's just the interest on a mortgage payment. And it's really uh, any interest expense on a loan that you had secured prior to February 15th, but that you secured with personal property. So if it's a line of credit that's secured with personal property, you could use it for that. But if it's not, if it's just like a business credit card, that interest expense is not gonna be relevant on the PPP side. So those are some key questions that we've got going there and we'll keep updating you guys on this piece now that folks are getting those awards and let you know what we continue to learn on getting full forgiveness. That was really helpful. <clears throat> um, if anybody's got questions as they come up, go ahead and type them into the chat box. I'm going to share my screen and, and talk to you a little bit about the um, uh, employee retention credit. I've mentioned it before and it's been part of our intro class, but I wanted to go through some um, uh, slides with examples of, of when and where the employee retention credit might be a better option for you. Um, so the employee retention credit is um, part of the CARES Act that hasn't gotten a lot of publicity, um, but it applies to nonprofits and in for-profit businesses, um, and you have to meet one of the following criteria in any calendar quarter. So your revenues are down 50% from um, before the crisis, or you were partially or fully ordered to close. All right, so the first part of that's pretty easy to establish. The second part of it is really any impairment to how you were operating ahead of time that was mandated by a government agency. So, um, so that, I mean, almost everyone falls into that category of partial or fully ordered to close. Um, so a lot of businesses qualify for, um, for, the, for the employee retention credit. 
the way the employee retention credit works is it will um, refund you for half the wages you pay your employees up to uh, $5,000 per employee. And it's paid through a tax credit. So basically, uh, when you do payroll, the amount of money that you're going to withhold uh, for federal taxes, you can act instead of sending that money to the federal government, you can actually convert that to operating funds um, through this credit. So it's pretty good. I mean, there, there's some advantages there because there's no application process. You do all of this through your own withholding with the payroll you're already handling. So um, a lot of the hassles that come with the Paycheck Protection Program don't exist. Now, the, um, the Paycheck Protection Program, of course, covers 100% of wages for two and a half months. It's paid through a forgivable loan, and you've got to get it from a private lender. I think everybody's really familiar with the PPP at this point. Um, so on first glance, it seems like the PPP is a way better deal, but I'm going to show you an example, a couple examples where it is and where it isn't, and some of them that it's a toss-up. So some of the, the downsides to the PPP, the PPP requires you to rehire all of your employees for the eight weeks immediately following getting the money. And you've got to pay them at least 75% of their previous wages. Um, and 75% of your PPP award must be used on those payroll costs. And the remaining 25%, like Bethany said, can be used on rent, utilities, or interest. So the ERC funds half your employees' wages during any quarter you meet one of the following criteria, 50% of your previous revenue or par partially or fully ordered to close. So that, that as long as you have experienced one of those criteria during a calendar quarter, then you're eligible for the ERC during that entire quarter and all the wages paid during that quarter. So the maximum credit is $5,000 per employee in total. So um, you can stretch this into multiple quarters where you meet the um, criteria, but no matter what the employee's pay rate is, you can't get more than five grand per employee. And here's the big kicker. You can only do this program or the PPP. You have to pick. So here's, a, here's one example, uh, a nonprofit organization, payroll of 600 grand, 10 employees, uh, partially ordered to close, and there have been no furloughs. So everyone is continuing to work. So if we did the employee retention credit, uh, we've got those 10 employees, that's an average of $60,000 a year or $15,000 a quarter uh, in salary for each employee. So half of their wages during the quarter would be 7,500 but the credit's capped at $5,000. So the ERC in this case would be worth those 10 employees times $5,000 credit. That'd be a $50,000 benefit. The PPP on the other hand is um, uh, two and a half months of those payroll costs. So it's $50,000 a month uh, basically in payroll costs. So the PPP is $125,000. Um, but like Bethany said, you don't get forgiveness on the EIDL and the PPP. So you've got to subtract the EIDL from the PPP. So it's really a net benefit of $115,000. Now I want to point out here that the EIDL and the PPP forgiveness are mutually exclusive, but it's not with the ERC. So you do have to reduce that out to compare apples to apples. So in this case, um, I think it's pretty clear that the PPP is still a better option. Even reducing out the EIDL benefit, um, it's $65,000 more than the ERC. Here's another example. Um, it's a for-profit business, a sole proprietor, and the owner's draws are around $60,000 annually. There are no employees, only independent contractors. The business is partially closed, and the owner's taking pandemic unemployment. So the problem in this case with the employee retention credit is that sole proprietors are not eligible without a professional employer organization. And I, most people don't have a PEO. So this one's gonna be way better off on the PPP because the ERC is not even an option. My next example is a for-profit business with a two and a half million dollar annual payroll and 75 employees. It's fully closed and required to remain closed. So this is something like a bar or a group of bars and all the employees have already been fur furloughed. If we did the employee retention credit for this business, the average compensation for each employee is around $33,000. So that's $8,300 per quarter. And so during that first quarter, that'd be a $4,200 credit. 
So the net benefit here is about $300,000 uh, on the employer retention side. Now on the PPP side, um, the PPP loans about $520,000 and um, subtract the EIDL, so it's about a $510,000 benefit. Um, so again, it seems like the PPP is a better deal for this business, but the PPP requires you to spend the money on payroll in eight weeks. So if this is a bar or a theater or um, any type of business that uh, is still not allowed to open, um, they'd have to rehire all their employees at a rate lower than unemployment. So you've got, um, I mean, so basically there's no benefit to 75% of, um, of the PPP loan there. So really the only reason to do the PPP would be for that 25% that can be used on utilities and rent. And so 25% of that is only 130K. So in this case, I think this is an example where the ERC is a better deal. Because again, there's really no advantage to bringing your staff back uh, now. And in fact, there's probably more downsides to bringing your staff back now with no work. So even though the PPP seems like 510, it's really only 130 grand that's actual benefit to the business. And if they decided instead of doing PPP to stick with the ERC, they'd have that $300,000 that could go towards their staffing costs later when they actually can reopen. Um, so there's just that comparison again between the ERC and the PPP showing that in this case, it'd probably be better for the business to uh, either not, either to send back their PPP money or not get one at all. The last example I have is a for-profit business, a $60,000 annual payroll with three employees. It's fully closed, required to remain closed. So this one probably again is a bar um, and all employees are furloughed. So in this case, um, the ERC um, breaks down. There's a $40,000 owner draw on that $60,000 and then $10,000 each to each of the independent contractors. So that's $10,000 per quarter for the owner draws, which is a $5,000 credit. Uh, the independent contractors are not eligible for the employee retention credit because they don't show up on the payroll reports. So it's just those, um, it's just those owner draws. So the, um, so the ERC benefits five grand. Well, in this case, the PPP is uh, two and a half months. So the PPP would be $8,000, but the EIDL got filled out, including those independent contractors. So they already got three grand from um, the uh, uh, EIDL. So it's $8,250 minus $3,000. So the, the PPP is, is 5250 so in this case, my advice would still be to go to the ERC. The PPP is way more complicated. There's more reporting standards. It's not worth the extra 250 bucks to do the PPP than it is the ERC. So um, I'll be happy to answer some questions about those comparisons at the end, but those are just um, some examples of um, the ERC versus the PPP that show um, you really do have to sit down. There's no decision tree for this. It's really case by case, but you need to sit down and really evaluate where you are and where you're going to decide or, and talk to one of us. Um, because uh, in each of those different businesses that are based on downtown, existing downtown businesses, some of them are better with the ERC and some of them are better with the PPP. And you do have to make a choice. So I'm gonna stop there and um, turn it over to um, Bethany. Are you introducing Corey or is Corey? Uh... Oh, well, it'd be my pleasure to introduce Corey. <laughs> um, yeah, we are really lucky at Newtown to have Corey Hall as a member of our board. She's a partner at James Bates, Brandon Gruber, um, and her expertise lies a lot in banking and finance, among other things. I've also asked her to speak to a couple topics that are very relevant to some business owners right now, post pandemic, some things related to um, disruption insurance claims that could be relevant to your business, as well as um, uh, business contracts and the force majeure clause in the business contract that may be relevant to you right now as you're kind of making decisions about um, the best kinds of business for you to stay engaged in and remain profitable in these unique times. 
And so Corey was very gracious as she always is to help out. Um, I wish I had gotten a little bit more about all her many accolade, accolades and, and community involvement, but she's a great leader in the community and we really appreciate that she's taking the time to join us and share her insight with us today. Take it away, Ms. Corey. All right, good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, very good. Bethany, thank you for the kind introduction, but the, the words of praise really belong to you, all of you business owners, because I know that this season has got to be one of the most challenging that you've experienced in a really long time, perhaps even ever as a business owner. Um, and I am constantly impressed with the creativity I'm seeing and how you're trying to stay open or market or just participate with each other and finding the best practices of how to survive this pandemic. So kudos to all of you and however I can help um, and how I can ever answer questions, please don't hesitate to let me know. I'm gonna cover three topics uh, real quick and try not to speak too much legalese and try to speak a little bit more practical business owner, but if for some reason I'm saying something or using a term that's not familiar or confusing, uh, just hit the chat feature, let me know. I'm trying to keep my eye on that as well so that way I can be helpful. Uh, the first one I'm gonna hit is the topic of business interruption insurance. I don't know how many of you have recently looked at your insurance policies, but you should. Uh, this is usually a coverage that is in your property or your casualty insurance. Uh, most businesses typically have something in their insurance policy called business interruption. Sometimes it's called business income coverage. But the goal and the, and the guidelines for this coverage is it's supposed to replace your business income in a disaster situation. A lot of times we think of disasters as hurricanes or fires. Uh, so when our building collapses, something that is a more physical disaster. But surprisingly, sometimes these coverages will actually include coverage for pandemics um, or they'll cover something like a government shutdown. So the first thing I would encourage you to do is get a copy of your insurance policy. Look to see if you have any business interruption or business income coverages. And then the things I want you to look for in that policy, typical language, are things like, um, are pandemics excluded specifically? Or are government actions included? Are government shutdowns included? Because we're not only just in the middle of a pandemic, we're in the middle of public health emergency orders or government orders. And so even though pandemic by itself may be excluded, there may be a category like a civil government action or civil government shutdown that is actually included. So you don't want to ignore one for the other and somehow miss out on a coverage. Uh, one of the hot topics that's going on, you can Google it and see it out there, is a lot of these policies are tied to what's called direct physical loss. And again, in a fire or hurricane, that's pretty easy, right? You know when your building has burned down that you've got a direct physical loss, the building is gone. And so you're gonna have business inc income interruption. Well, there's a lot of litigation starting around whether or not direct physical loss is inclusive of uh, your, the, your government shutting down your use and access to the building or having people come and go. So keep in mind that something like direct physical loss may be something that you wanna talk to your insurance agent or your insurance company about and make sure that you file a claim or at least be considered for a claim so that way you know whether or not your insurance company is loosening up their definition of a direct physical loss for the COVID pandemic. Um, as co Congress is actually trying to put pressure on insurance companies to loosen up that definition right now. So don't ignore it. Look for that in your insurance policy and see if that's out there. Um, something else to consider is there's also contingent business income coverage. Those contingent policies are things that add a line item in your insurance for losses in connection with your supply chain. So if you find that your uh, business is dependent on paper towels or meat or any of the things that are affected in supply chain, look to see if you've got a contingent income um, coverage in your insurance policy as well. Uh, another one to look for that I'm sure you already have is event cancellation. That's a big one right now, both for events that you are planning that will give you income or also events that you are going to travel to that would also be something that's part of your normal business. So look for that as well, because that may be another source of replacing income from something like the Cherry Blossom Festival that you may have lost out on, or um, some of the spring activities that are usually planned like beer festivals or concerts and things like that. 
So that's, those are the three big ones I would tell you. Look for business income coverage or business interruption. Look for contingent income interruption. And then also look for event cancellation, both on things that you're gonna to travel to and also things that you're gonna host. Um, and work with your insurance agent to make sure that you're asking about whether or not those coverages are something that you can apply for. But also keep in mind that sometimes you're gonna to you're gonna to want to, have to go and file a claim anyway, regardless of what your agent says, because your agent is not always the outcome determining factor of whether or not you've got a claim. That's gonna be the claims representative. And so you want to make sure that you follow the guidelines in your insurance policy for giving notice to the insurance company, not just your insurance agent, but your insurance company, because a lot of times your insurance agents are independent brokers and they're not necessarily tied to your specific insurance company. So look at your policy, make sure you read the notice provisions and make sure you give notice underneath of the policy, just like you, just like the instructions require, because a lot of insurance companies will try to um, avoid claims based on lack of notice or improper notice. So make sure you follow those instructions really well. And if you have questions, let me know. Um, next category is something to look at in your business contracts. It's a clause called a force majeure clause. And what that really means is it is a type of event that's beyond your control or your fault that is causing you not to be able to perform your contract. So some of those may be something like a building contract or a supplier contract, um, distribution, or uh, you know, something that would, you're buying and selling different things uh, to third parties. Look for that because there's no standard language. Typically, they are cap, they're called force majeure in the contract itself, but look to see what is included in force majeure. If you feel like you are not gonna be able to perform on a contract or going to default on a contract. Instead of breaching the contract, look for these clauses because what they do is they excuse your performance within certain, within certain um, events that are listed. A lot of people are now putting pandemics in their force majeure clauses as they're navigating new contracts. Uh, some may not have pandemics included in there, but they may have things like, again, civil action, government shutdowns, government orders, public health emergencies. Again, look at the various wording in your force majeure clauses because the benefit to you may be one, to get out of a contract or to terminate the contract that you don't wanna be in anymore or that you can't afford to be in without having to terminate the contract under your normal termination provisions. Or two, you're not gonna be in breach of a contract because that's something else that could be very expensive right now is breaching contracts are going into default underneath of a contract. So look at those. Uh, Georgia is a pretty strict uh, construction state. We look at those terms pretty strictly. So if it says pandemic, that's a good thing for you. If it says government shutdown, that's a good thing for you. But something like the phrase act of God is probably not going to apply because a lot of contracts have been looked at for whether or not a pandemic or a government shutdown falls underneath of an act of God. And those are usually re re reserved for something like lightning, hurricanes, um, spontaneous fires, and things like that. So keep in mind that you're really going to look at that provision and you're going to want to make sure that uh, you've checked it out to see if there's anything in there for you to negotiate your contract with either the person, uh, the vendor that you're with or the supplier to see if they'd rather keep your business um, and on what terms, and maybe renegotiate a new contract with you or whether or not you can use it to get out of a contract altogether that maybe isn't even in your best interest on a normal basis anyway. So look carefully at those um, to see what you can find. Um, just finally hitting on the borrowing and workouts, Bethany asked me to touch on this. I do a lot of work with commercial businesses and banks on the workout side versus um, individuals on the consumer side. So my comments are gonna be largely focused on the um, commercial side. What I would tell you is that in a workout scenario, in situations like this, where you're finding it difficult to pay your loans, your contracts, your bills, and things like that, there's a couple categories I tell people not to ignore. One is don't stop paying your taxes. Um, just because you um, have a shortage of funds doesn't mean you should stop paying your taxes because there's a lot of penalties and things that accrue if you don't. Uh, don't stop paying your insurance premiums. All the insurance coverages I just talked about 
will be out the door if you stop paying on your insurance premiums. So don't ignore those. Uh, don't ignore your key suppliers because if you have want to keep your business going, you want to make sure that you actually have the thing to sell. Um, the other thing I would tell you is when you're talking through things, go call your banker. If you don't have a relationship with your banker, this is a really good time to start one. Call them, talk with them about your finances, show them your, um, your income and statements and your financials, show them how things are going and where you've got expenses and costs and talk with them about whether or not there's an option for you to refinance at a lower interest rate or skip a payment, but don't just skip a payment in a vacuum and ignore it. Talk with them about it because usually they're a lot more interested in chatting with you about how to work out your problems on the front end because they really want to keep you as a customer and they want to keep your interest accruing and you want to keep the loan a good loan on the good side of the bank because the moment that you stop paying and you don't, you're not really thinking through things, it transfers to a different side of, of the financial institution, which is usually the, the workout side and they have a little less flexibility um, on those things than they do. So talk with them. Uh, talk with your suppliers, the ones that are not outcome determinative. Ask if you can skip a month or if you can make it up in a month, but just keep that communication open because on the workout side, assuming that things don't go well, what you don't need is you don't need a business that can't function. So that way you can't pay anything in a workout scenario or they start looking at any personal guarantees that you have to see what assets you have to satisfy the gap in between what your business is earning and what you, what you really have. So it's important to try to focus on those key heartbeat points of your business, your taxes, your insurance, your suppliers, and then have conversations with others along the way, either trying to look at those force measure clauses, see where there's extra insurance coverage to help you generate some funds. Or I think Bethany and Josh have done a great job of saying, look at what other resources are out there and talk with your suppliers and your, and your um, other parties that you're in contract with or your bankers about where you're, where you're trying to get other supports uh, for, for income. So with that, I'll stop um, and just see if there's any other, other questions. That was really helpful, Corey. I, I mean, so I guess the core of it is you've got to protect the things that enable your business to function in the yeah. short term. Because as soon as you lose those, as soon as the business has no, no prospect of operating profitably, you've lost all leverage to negotiate anything. That's right. right. Yep. And then you're only looking at your collateral as something that you could sell and try to work out. And a lot of times collateral is not necessarily worth what you paid for. Yeah. Um, and it's not necessarily going to sell well in an atmosphere where a lot of other people are going to start selling their collateral too. Um, I know that um, restaurant business collateral, for example, is pretty swamped right now. Uh, yeah. So think for that. Yeah, and, and that leads me to my second thing is I think people tend to underestimate lenders' motivations to work with you, but no lender wants to foreclose for exactly the reasons you just outlined. It gets really nasty really fast. The collateral's never worth what you think it is. It comes back to a personal guarantee and selling off all your personal stuff. So, um, so I, I think lenders are pretty motivated on the front end to work with you if there's any prospect of them getting payments going forward. That's right. And they may know about different programs within their bank or within um, their, their system that you don't know about and that you may be eligible for. So call them. I mean, they may know something that you don't. The other thing I think that you pointed out that, that most people don't know about is the, um, the uh, workout divisions that at some point, your loan's going to move from the bankers you all you know and love <laughs> to, to people who do nothing but but um, collect on bad loans. That's right. Right, and so I think that for some people they stay stuck because well, I mean it happens to all of us. Like none of us want to fess up to the bad stuff, right, and have to deal with that head on. And so we just wait too long, and we don't even know that these things are transitioning to a different part of the bank. But um, but I think that's really good advice too, is talk to the banker that you have a relationship with early um, mm -hmm. before things move to special assets. That's right. And I think that's uh, the biggest caution I would tell you is a lot of times I see people robbing Peter to pay Paul. Don't, it's, it's not worth it. It does not help you in a workout scenario. Um, you need to be calling people and asking what the terms are. Hey, I usually pay within 60 days. Can I pay within 90 this time? 
um, you know, ask for terms and ask for extensions, call, because you don't know until you ask. And then you can really assess where your money needs to go in priority versus just guessing and hoping that you're right. We, we see a lot of that too, that, mm -hmm. that um, uh, people try and solve their own problems without having to communicate with anyone, which usually okay. means um, credit cards or um, really high interest usurious online loans, right? Anything they can do without having the communication because the communication is tough. It's but tough. Um, but you've, you've severely limited your options at that point and maybe left some stuff on the table that would have been much, much easier to deal with and more likely to make your business survive. That's right. Um, so uh, that, was, that was great. Thank you so much, Corey. That was very helpful. Um, the other thing I mentioned thinking about what Corey just said is, you know, Bethany is still doing cash flow classes and the other thing that I think it makes even more compelling, we talked about this with grants, but it's the same with businesses and lenders, is if you have a plan. Is if you can say, look, if we could restructure at this rate over this term, my business will survive. And here are the numbers that show you my income and expense that prove that, right? I think you're much, much better off if you can lay out a case for, what, for the assistance you need from your lender to show that it's going to work. Uh, instead of just saying, I can't make it this month, I don't know about next month, is actually have something that, you know, is several months forward that shows that, that you figured this out and that their help will make all the difference. Yeah, and I might, uh, to add to that, I think people, it's not just for the sake of the lender, but it's for your sake, because you're going to have a lot more confidence in that conversation with your lender when you're clear for yourself what kind of payments you really can make. Because if you have that conviction and that understanding for yourself of where you stand financially, I think you're gonna feel a lot uh, more assured and clear about what you need to get out of the conversation and what kind of terms will be doable for you. Um, and Corey's gonna join me tomorrow for a webinar in the afternoon, a recovery coaching program webinar, getting into a little more detail about prioritizing your bills and, and emergency cash flow management. So. Great. Um, so the only question we've got in the chat box so far is from um, Felicia about the EIDL advance. So she asks, are we required to enter the EIDL advance if we entered it after April 3rd? And I think this is related to the PPP application process. It depends. I, I mean, I would only, I would answer the question as specifically as it's written on the lender's application form. And so I, I, I think you probably are talking about the um, Fundera application. It specifically, it only says if you received an award prior to April 3rd. And so um, if the answer to that is no, then I would say no. Um, the only thing you have to keep track of there, you can get both the EIDL and the PPP. You can spend both the EIDL and the PPP, but they're not both gonna be forgiven. And um, the EIDL repayment terms, we expect to match the EIDL loans. So, you know, 25 years, three and three quarters percent. So very affordable, way more affordable than the PPP repayment terms. Um, but no, you, you know, I would just answer the form. Ex I would answer the questions on the form exactly as they're written and they vary by lender. Um, but on Fundera specifically, I would, I would not, it says April 3rd. So um, that's, that's what I would answer. Are there any other questions? um out there Josh I have a I have a question about the uh, employee retention credit it, isn't that until uh December 31st yes it runs until the end of the year and so but but you have to qualify in every quarter that you claim the credit right so you you, you have to have had you have to have had either the 50 percent revenue drop um or the partially or fully ordered to close during each quarter you claim the credit. So I know we were talking about there's a $5,000 aggregate limit, but if you have employees who are not maxing that out in one quarter and you wanna stretch that into more quarters, you can only stretch that into more quarters if you qualify under those criteria in a different quarter. But yeah, as long as you have one of those qualifying criteria you can meet, uh, it goes until um, the end of the year, the end of 2020. I got you. And, and saying what you were just talking about with the uh, question about the EIDL, yeah, my application for the PPP, which I turned down, asked if I had received the EIDL, but I had not yep. received it. So I put no. 
yep. even though it did come in a few days later. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's the other, yes. I mean, that, that's the right answer. The right answer is to answer the question exactly as it's written on the form. Um, and then you've just got to keep track of, 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 of you know, some of that money is going to get paid back if, if you do the PPP along with it. Um, but but I, I still think that, I mean, that's really cheap money. And God knows when they'll get around to working out who's got to pay back what. So, you know, I, I would I would just answer however it's listed on the form um, and, and figure the rest out later. Um, but, yeah, I mean, maybe that's probably a moot point now because if you do the ERC instead of the PPP, you don't have to worry about that um, uh, double forgiveness. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just thinking that, you know, let's say – couple of quarters from now you know uh, businesses come back we're back open we're not having to be shut down I still think that sales would be 50 percent less would be my guess you know just because I don't see people getting back that fast and yeah. he's coming back that fast and all that stuff and just didn't want to assume that I was going to be getting something and then you know of course I guess if business picks up and everything's great it really doesn't matter well yeah that, well there you go right it's one or the other <laughs> Well, either you'll be able to claim the credit or, or business will be so good you won't have to worry about it. Um, I think that's absolutely true. You've only got to meet it during the quarter too. So, right, like it could be that as long as you qualify um, during part of the quarter then uh, and business picks up, you're still okay. Or I think it's entirely likely that, um, that these social distancing regulations will still be interpreted as a partial closure. Right. If you're not open, if you're not allowed to seat at your um, at your um, at the capacity allowed by the fire marshal, I think that probably still counts as a um, partial closure mandated by the government. And so um, that would also be a qualifying criteria. And I imagine that's going to go on for quite some time. Anybody else have any other questions or comments? This is uh, Di. I wanted to talk a little bit, I uh, want James to talk a little bit about unemployment because I did file back in April. So I know they backlogged, but is it anything else we need to do? It said it was processed. But then I got a letter and said it rejected me. So is it anything else I need to do? Great. Dot, so, yeah. Dot, you pay yourself as a, through a draw? Or no. I just do at the end of the year. Okay. And I find. So yeah, you're you're kind of in the same position Scott is. I don't think you need to do anything else. They're supposed to send you that email where they ask for your um, earnings information from your tax. You know the 1040, and when they do that, then they'll process the the pandemic side of it. And so we we at this point don't know of anybody who's actually navigated the whole process. Um, they they only started taking those, they only started working those since April twenty second. So it's only been a couple of weeks. I, I know that's not helpful, but uh, we just don't know anybody that successfully navigated it. Uh, but I okay, think, sounds like you've done all that you're supposed to do at this point. Okay, thank you, James. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions out there? Well, I want to I want to say a special thanks to Corey. I really appreciate you joining us. That was really um, helpful information. You hate to start thinking about all that stuff, but um, but I mean it makes all the difference to be doing it the right way and, and to know where you need to start. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to. And if anyone has questions, my email address is out there on our website. I'm happy to just be a phone a friend. So just call and. Let me see how I can help. Uh, and then it was great to talk to the rest of you. It was great to see you. I um, It's unimaginable that we're still doing this, but I appreciate so much all of your optimism, your smiles, your hard work, your continuing to uh, stay at this. You know, th there are big companies that have huge departments that are working at all this stuff, and we are all trying to do it together. But um, 
but it, it makes me so proud of each of you, um, how sophisticated you are about figuring out these complicated programs and then tailoring them to make sure that your business benefits um, and survives. So we're all here. We'll continue to be here. Anything you want to follow up individually, please let us know. I'm thinking about all y'all all the time. Um, I look forward to seeing you at this uh, webinar every week and um, look forward to helping with anything else we can. I hope you all have a great week and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Bye everybody.